Um, we're on. We are. Rolling. We are rolling. Great. So I guess just tell me how you first came to work with Gina and what your first impression of her was. Well, um, a, a former student of mine actually uh, knew her, and um, she had been working with a coach previously. I mean, for quite some time. And he had passed away, so when the time came and she needed another one, he recommended me. And we got together and that was it. It was love at first sight. My um, first impression of her, is just as a, as a woman, was how shy she is. And um, reserved and, you know, because I only knew her from films where she really lets it all go, which is terrific. So that was... Um, and. That was my initial introduction and impression. And following that was uh, how tall she is, which surprised me. And how beautiful, you know, she's gorgeous. But her, she's so disciplined. It's astounding. If all actors had even a tenth of that, they'd be a lot better than they think they are. Her discipline uh, is incredible, and particularly on that first film where she was, you know, around the clock, going from one training aspect to another. It was um, awesome. I mean, there were times that she'd come by at night where she could hardly hold her head up, but we would still work. Mm -hmm. What do you think drives that discipline? Well, it's that... I, doing the very best that you can to get the best out of yourself. And if you have a lot to give, you want to give it. You want to get, get it out. And uh, there's the joy of creating also. It's really almost like problem solving sometimes, particularly with that role in uh, The Long Kiss Goodnight. It was a lot of problem solving. And that's a challenge. And it makes it exciting to develop a character, particularly one as complex as that. And also the need to, I don't know, get into something else, get into an, uh, another skin, you know. And if you have any respect for yourself or your and your work, you are going to do the best that you can. You're just not going to mail it in. I mean, you know, that's for the. Mm, never mind. But you know, <laughs> so is there an example of a problem solving? issue that you guys came across, like with oh. a specific scene, and, and how oh, yeah. did you work through that? There were many. The, the primary problem uh, that we had to deal with was, you know, it was a dual character. One doesn't know about the other. And uh, the second one, the one who emerged later, uh, I think Charlie it was... Charlie Baltimore. Uh, huh? Charlie Baltimore. Uh, that's the original one, she, I oh. think, and Samantha was the wife mother. Right. And w the time when uh, um, Charlie starts to emerge was in that wonderful kitchen scene, which was uh, singled out by a lot of reviewers. When and how does do we see Charlie beginning to emerge? And so, because that's not really in the script, um, there are other scenes where one shifts into the other, but the problem becomes one of subtlety. How much of the original person is going to come out? Is Samantha, the second person, going to be aware that Charlie is there? Um, so it was those subtle things, and you, you don't want to go into a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing, it's, you know, with this a chord of music and suddenly somebody else emerges, you know, it's just like a magic act, it's ridiculous. It would have no credibility, you know, it would be laughable. So that was our primary thing throughout the film, for every scene. Uh, and in the kitchen scene, we, you know, talked about all kinds of ideas, and then it became the idea of her chopping changes, instead of chopping like a, you know. And if you remember, she, Samantha, the wife, got so carried away with all of a sudden the, having found, discovered the skill of chopping that it became, you know, very festive. Um, so it was things like that that were subtle, had to be chosen in a particular place, which 
aspect of the character would dominate, which one would start becoming aware or when of the other, and so on. And then there was another scene uh, towards the end when she, her child is endangered, she's in danger of dying. And that's when Charlie, who's now the dominant one in that scene, starts experiencing her own maternal instincts. So it, it was, that was always a thing of blending subtly into that other aspect of the self. And so that, those were the things that we worked on very, very hard. We really did. Um, uh, there was a scene in the bar when she meets our villain, a good-looking guy who's now starring on Broadway, um, how to play that scene, for example. Um, and I worked with him on that, on that scene, on that role as well, and the idea was always to really play it for real, the flirtation, and without, you know, giving it away, you know, how sometimes an actor winks at an audience and says, I'm really mean, I'm really a villain, and so we, we would work on things like that, so that there was always this, uh, a bottom line reality that you could really buy into as an audience and then suddenly, and then gradually become surprised by what you see, or in retrospect, become surprised because then the scene, other scene comes along and then it um, reveals something. And you go, oh, wait a minute. That, but it, it, you see, and so it, it engages an audience's attention and interest. And that was, um, that was, that was it, the bottom line, is when, how. Well, you mentioned in the, the carrot cutting scene that you guys had come up with that together as a device to bring out this other character. So, does she do that often? Does she bring her own scenes to the table um, to help with her character development? Well, uh, I read the script, and of course she did. And then, well, the first time we got together, we just discussed. She was very clear about what she felt were going to be the, the problems she had to confront because it was a dual role. So she um, was very, uh, very concerned about that, and so that became our. It started us off on that, on that track. The character was already in the in the script, but it was a matter of how. You know, um, what would happen? And I don't remember the detail now about whether it's in the writing where suddenly she starts shopping faster, but even if it's in the script. It is how the chopping, suddenly the accelerated chopping, would, uh, what kind of an impact it would have on Samantha. Would she be horrified? Would she, you know, where the hell did that come from? Um, but what Gina came up with, see, and, and this was on her own, because that's how she, that's what she does. It became a feast. It was festive. And it took off on that. Now, it wasn't pre we didn't predetermine that that should be her initial reaction, but that's what happened to her spontaneously, and that's why she, she's, she's free that way. And she trusts herself, which is uh, fabulous, mm -hmm. so that she will allow those things to emerge, you know, and those are the wonderful moments. Mm -hmm. So to what degree, I mean, just not only in this film, but you think in all the films you've seen of her, to what degree are we seeing... Gina's own creativity come out in her character as opposed to the script or the director or what was there before she took Well, <clears throat> very few directors really contribute much to the development uh, of a character through the instrument of the actor. Very few. So that's why so many actors, um, uh, leading actors in particular, you know, have a lot of responsibility in the film why they may end up going to a coach, because they're not going to get the fine-tuned detail from a film director, because a film director usually wouldn't know what to say anyway. They can speak in broad generalities, but uh, the kind of finesse and the kind of complete character, if you will, comes from a different kind of homework, and it's very detailed, uh, it's very precise, 
And at the same time, once you make your choices, then you have to be willing to let them go. You know, not to forget them, but to let them go so that if something else emerges, let it, it's fresh, you know, let it be. And that's where Gina is really marvelous at that. Um, and that, that was a case in point, was that the way that kitchen scene turned into a big festival. So, um, God, give me the question again. I, I may have strayed. Oh, well, I'm just wondering, um, you know, to what degree are we seeing her and these characters? Oh, as well, we see, around her well, the thing, the thing that separates um, a really, truly creative, gifted actor from other actors who are good and acceptable is that they find the character within themselves, you know? And that's really what it's about. Uh, it's not about all the external stuff, uh, but it's finding it in yourself and then breathing that truth into it, because everybody has everything in them. It's just a matter of which is more pronounced and which is has to be dug out a little bit. Um, and that's what gives her the ability to also trust her impulses, her instincts. Because once she's really, she really believes in all of it, or any actor of, with any gift and talent and skill, and self-trust, which is really important, um, will go with the flow, not impede it, not operate out of their heads, but out of their hearts, so to speak, out of their instincts. So I think that everything we have seen her do has always come from her. She told me a wonderful story once. Um, what was she auditioning for? I think it was Accidental Tourist. Yeah, Did she tell you the story? Well, yeah. I read about it. She had to go through a screen test and all kinds of other things. Yeah, but it's along the lines of what you're uh, asking me about. She was behind a flat waiting. I don't know what ha happened. I don't remember the detail about that. But something occurred. It had nothing to do with her, but it really upset her. And... And she's thinking backstage like any actor would, oh, for, you know, I'm supposed to be angry. Now, how am I going to get angry now? With I know what it is. If, if you want to start over, it's uh, what I read about was it's the makeup person maybe poked her in the eye or something like that? Maybe, yeah. yeah. A detail like that. Uh, and she used that anger to her advantage? Yeah, but, but it was at that moment when she realized, which is probably the, the hardest lesson one can learn, but the most important, my character is angry. I'm angry. That's it. I don't need anything else. I'll just use it. You've heard that expression, I'm sure. Use it. Well, she did, and uh, that was a major, I think, breakthrough for any actor. And she's been doing that ever since. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she says that she always brings her own emotion to her role. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Because she finds it in herself, you see. Mm -hmm. you know, she really does. So. Yeah. And that's what great actors do. So what what does she do? I mean, besides from this example, of having her eye poked. <laughs> what does she do to, to to bring out these emotions, maybe that are deep within her, and apply them to a role? Well, part of it is imagine. You know, a great deal of it is imagination. A great deal is an original ability, an innate ability to empathize with somebody else's situation. Other actors will go through it uh, a little more methodically. You know, they will literally say, gee, when did I feel that way? Or uh, when did that happen to me? In her case, we've never talked about that. Um, and she's never actually rehearsed the scenes with me. We never went over the dialogue, you know, back and forth, where other actors will do that. But she, in the process of analyzing the character, making being aware of when certain things ought to, ha ought to happen. She, it becomes integrated into her soul, if you will, um, so that when she's on the set, she's ready to go because it's all there. She's integrated not only her instincts, but <clears throat> the things that are necessary. And, and then she trusts herself and she goes with it. And that's because we never, we have never gone over lines. I don't mean for memorization, but reading a scene back and forth and seeing, you know, how it plays. It's more so, like the instinct. Well, it's instinct and intellect. <coughs> well, <she's coughs> Excuse me. <intellect. clears throat> yeah, she, 
She's very bright. We all know that, don't we? And she takes copious notes. Copious. I mean, I really never did look at her script, but maybe one day I might. It. She was writing all the time, all the time, get an idea. And we would shoot things back and forth. And she, whatever she'd say would give me an idea, whatever I might say would fire an idea in her. And it was that kind of collaboration, which is really fun. I just find that so much fun. And she did too, so, you know, she, she got a lot out of that. Um, th I mean, that's the way she prefers to work. Mm -hmm. so, well, intellectually, she says that she uses all of her intellectual resources to come to the understanding of the character. That's right. Once, yeah. Once they yell action, she blank. You know, she makes sure she blanks out her own mental, you know, processes, so she right. can become the character. That's right. Because she's if she didn't turn those off, she'd be first of all watching herself, directing herself. She wouldn't be in the moment. Um, it would cut off all spontaneity because she'd be thinking out of her head and following a map rather than trusting that all the homework that she did, and she does a lot of homework, has all seeped in. And now all she has to do is just let it go. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you do that? I mean, how do you, how do you blank out your, what you're thinking and just act from your heart? You have to, well, that's what makes the difference between an actor and I guess somebody else. Um, you just have to know how to make believe, you know? Uh, it's really a it's a childlike thing in a way. This is, oh, gee, uh, what am I? Well, I don't know. I'm a fireman. And you really have to believe it. You have to believe that the person over there is truly wounded that you have to rescue. Um, or that, you know, you're not in shining armor, just walk through the door. Now, you can believe that in a make-believe way, or you can choose to replace that actual person coming in with your fantasy person, you know? Uh, and that will evoke a response from you. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole idea, is to uh, find those things that will evoke an emotional response so that it affects, you know, everything. You can see it in the face and the eyes. And, you know, you mention something to somebody, they're listening, they're listening, and suddenly they light up. Well, that's it. It's that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so it turns them on. Mm -hmm. um, what about her work before you met her? What, what were you a fan of most? Like, what films stick out in your head? Oh, well, I mean, how can I, anybody ever forget Thelma and Louise? Oh, it was, I mean, uh, extraordinary. She was absolutely wonderful in that. And then there was another one that I saw on television. Um, after Long Kiss Goodnight. It was a comedy. It was a romantic comedy. I forget who she Speechless. was playing with. Huh? Speechless? Maybe Michael that was Keaton. it. Huh? Michael Keaton? Yeah. Yes, that was it. She was a delight. As a light comedian. I mean, you know, all these other roles didn't um, ask that of her. But she was just delightful which is what you need to be in a romantic comedy, and at the same time be believable, and at the same time not be uh, cutesy, if you know what I mean. And she is cute. I mean, she's just got that going personally. You, know, you don't expect that, but she is. She's adorable. Um, but it was really quite lovely to see that element of her. So she really has an enormous range. She really does. It would be fun if she ever played Lady Macbeth, huh? She's up to it. She'll, she's got it to do it, you know? Yeah. It would really be interesting. Yeah. That leads me to two more of my questions. The yeah. range, I wanted to ask you about that. How does she, you know, she thrives in so many different genres. And, is her, and you've worked with her on action. And then I think you had a couple conversations with her about Stuart Little, which is sort yes, of yeah. fantasy and fun. Right. And the Gina Davis show, which has a huge comedic oh. element. Right. So does she approach all those differently? I mean, does she have what techniques does she use so that she can so seamlessly go between different genres? Well, um, again, she starts with the character. Um, 
and uh, the relationships and what is important, what is not important, what should be important. Uh, to give you an example, um, in the uh, series, she is supposed to, t and this is in the pilot, she's supposed to take this the child of her new lover on a play date, the little girl. Did you ever see that, that I show? I caught a couple minutes oh. of one, but I'm okay. still waiting to get episodes. Well, the, little, the kids were just, <laughs> they were terrific. And she's supposed to take her on a play date. And um, she goes to the office, and she is uh, going over her schedule with her assistant. And suddenly it hits her that, oh, my Lord, she forgot to meet take the kid, the little girl, on her play date. Well, you know, she's really, the character is really being tested. Would she be a good mom, you know, and so on? Would she be up to it? And here she had failed her first test. So the normal thing, of course, is to panic. You know, it's just when you realize, oh, my God, what have I done, and so on. Now, the... I, I, I don't know if it came from something that I felt from her, but I remember saying, you know, this is an important moment in the evolution of your relationship with your boyfriend. Um, and you want to establish a really good bond with that little girl, and you blew it. It seemed to me that it could be taken very seriously. And if you really feel like, you know... Um, Mm. expressing your pain, your grief, your fear over having failed one of your first tests, I would encourage you to do it because in comedy in particular, is uh, people in general don't realize that the more serious you are in uh, a particular kind of situation, the funnier it is. If you don't make it real to you, we have no way of saying, oh, you silly thing for just getting so upset over, you know, tripping over a rug. Um, we, we can't do that. If you don't take it seriously, we can't find the humor in the situation. So, at any rate, she did incorporate that. And um, one of the things, and I went to the shooting of the pilot, and... Um, and a couple of people mentioned how delicious that moment was. Now, she had modified it, you know. Um, had I been directing, I would have had to go all the way, but I'm, I'm not directing. So I would have suggested that anyway and see how it played, and uh, I think it would have played fine. But she modified it somewhat, but it was uh, something a lot of people pointed out that night. So it was that kind of thing we, we were doing, or um, uh, she has a... Um, she has an argument with her boyfriend, and she's in her pajamas. And um, anyway, she goes out of the bedroom, and she has a little girl crying. So she goes in and to talk to her. And that became a wonderful scene because I think the little girl had lost the shoes to her little doll or something. And Gina really got into it and in finding it and becoming, helping her as, as a little girl, helping the little girl to find it for her. And it was a tender, loving, not sticky um, scene at all, which allowed us to see another element in her, you see. Instead of being cute, 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 you know, sticky, sticky, as we see on television. And that was another thing that we, we would discuss, things like that, or... Uh, she has a conversation with her three best friends who uh, that same night, and she tells them about the argument. And uh, and she's, you know, upset about it. And I said, the more upset you are, the better. <laughs> you know, so that there's always that range. And she's getting advice from her girlfriends. And one of them says, yeah, but it's so much fun to make up in bed. You know, she goes, oh, yeah. Oh. So she knew how to get back and how to make peace with him. So the idea then was to, when before she goes back into the bedroom, was how does she turn these silly male pajamas or pajamas, you know, into something sexual and humorous at the same time. 
And then, of course, the 11-year-old boy, a 10-year-old boy, comes out of his bedroom and he sees her getting ready, so that led us into something else. But that's the kind of, of um, a discussion and things we'd finally get into and mark. But it all had to still come from her own inner need to make up, her own need to uh, be able to identify with a little five-year-old girl who loses, you know, her dolly's shoes or I forget what it was. It was it was a darling, darling scene. Or when uh, there's that ten-year-old boy staring at you with only half your clothes on, you know, how do you deal with that and still not make a, a big deal out of it? So it was those kinds of details that um, we would work on, and that's what was fun, you know, is finding things uh, that come out of the reality of a situation that are not written out, spelled out by the writer. And that's what we did. Okay. Well, you know, she got great reviews in that sitcom. Yeah. She's gotten great reviews basically on her career. Even when things tank. Um, she had a couple early TV series that didn't do so well, but she came out of it, you know, smelling like a rose. Well, that's talent for you. Yeah. So why, why didn't that show ultimately work? I mean, she was so great in it. I have no idea. The cast was fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. I didn't see it very often because I have a class. I had a class on that night. So I might catch the last 10 minutes of, of it or something. I, I have no idea. Uh, go figure. I just don't know. What does anybody know why some things are so bad and so successful? Yeah. And throw an answer in that one. Yeah. Mm. It's a fickle business, I guess. It's weird. There's, I just don't, I don't understand. I will not mention names, but I don't understand how those series are on. They're boring, they're predictable, and I'm talking about comedies as well as the dramas. I, Everybody always looks the same, week in, week out, always the same kinds of lines. You know, it's gotten to, you know, I know exactly how they're going to look if they're angry, how they're going to look if... It's nothing fresh or spontaneous yeah. in what, um, what I see. So, no, I'd rather see shows like yours. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, how are we doing on tape? Uh, we could speak a time change. Okay. Let me just see what we haven't.